Good morning, everyone. It's kind of ironic that uh, I'm leading this panel because our, our major challenge, but also opportunity at McMichael is being not downtown Toronto. It's being out of the center. We're literally 40 minutes from downtown Toronto, and that um, means that uh, one of our struggles is to communicate with a broader audience, but also it liberates us in many ways that we can, that we can talk about today. So what a wonderful group of people. Um, sorry, it was a bit of a hair-raising arrival this morning. I had a, a, a supernatural experience last night and slept for 11 and a half hours. <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen today, but it's going to be something wonderful. Um, anyway, thank you all for being here. It's, it's, this has been such a fantastic weekend so far, and I know um, it's just only going to get better from here. Uh, we're going to uh, start by talking... Uh, with my friend Michelle Jakes, who uh, is uh, in charge of all things curatorial at the Reme in Saskatoon, which used to feel like it was far from the center of things, but uh, no longer under your leadership. And we've been very fortunate to co-produce the current <laughs> Merrill McMaster exhibition, which um, has been with you and is now heading on its way to Joliet and then off to the Herd uh, Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, and thenceward around the U.S., but um, Michelle is a great colleague, and she's been doing important things both in the center in Toronto and then more recently in other points uh, west in Canada. So Michelle has her slide advancer, and what I'm going to do is ask the panelists to advance their own slides. And they're going to talk for 15, 20 minutes or so about the projects they've done and, and how they think about um, uh, communicating, creating community, creating opportunity for artists from what we used to think of as the margins, but I'm not sure we even do anymore in the art world. So take it away, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's nice to see you again. We seem to be following each other around the country. Exactly. We were just together. I just have to point out, you know, Whitehorse. We were on the Yukon art uh, jury together recently up in Whitehorse, and here are the creators, Julie and David, of the Yukon Art Prize, and they have done a great job of centering the margins. So anyway, I digress. Thank you. Um, it's very nice to be back at the art fair in my hometown. Until 2012, I uh, lived primarily in Toronto, worked at the Art Gallery of Ontario for a long time, but um, found myself uh, getting mar more and more marginalized, I guess. Uh, first moved to the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria uh, on Vancouver Island, and for the past two and a half or so years, I've been the chief curator at Ramey Modern in Saskatoon. Um, which, uh, interesting, let me see if I can get these slides going. What am I point? Oh, perfect. Um, so this slide uh, um, shows you a kind of aerial view of Saskatoon and the pink arrow points to Ramey Modern. Saskatoon is uh, known as the Paris of the Prairies because of the river and the bridges. But as you can tell from this image, it's a lot smaller than Paris <laughs> because you don't have to look too far to see the, the farmland and the, the prairie beyond the small city. So it's a bit of a, um, I was going to call it a miracle, but of course um, a lot of hard work went into getting this incredible building this incredible art gallery built in Saskatoon. Um, there's not much else like it mm -hmm. in the city. Um, so we have uh, the challenge of running a world-class art museum in a city that is not used to having world-class things in its midst. Um, and I think that uh, since I've been there under the direction of the current directors, Aileen Burns and Yuan Lund, um, we really, that's the thing we've been struggling with, how to be relevant to um, the communities in a small city, a city of, uh, I think, a population of under 300,000, when um, 
the initial impetus behind this museum was to create something that would uh, draw an international audience and um, sort of um, <coughs> pass over or overlook the people who were right there. So a lot of the projects that we've been doing um, have been about uh, reestablishing that, that place of rootedness and local relevance, which is not to say that we're only working with, uh, with local artists. What we're doing is trying to um, find the relevance in everything that we do. So I'll show you an image of the interior. This building was um, designed by Bruce Kuwabara, who is a Toronto architect and quickly becoming um, the, the kind of foremost architect of museums in Canada. And this is the beautiful atrium of the building. He was really looking to uh, prairie architecture, the prairie style as his touchstone. And that's what it looks, looked like when we first opened. And last year, we introduced um, a work by Nick Cave to the atrium. This is a piece called Spinner Forest, which um, just fills the entire atrium. And Nick is an artist who is from Missouri, so, and now he lives in Chicago, so far away geographically from, from Saskatoon. But there's um, something in his, in his work that um, uh, makes me think that there must be some sort of metaf metaphysical or philosophical relationship between his experiences as a kid in Missouri and um, our current experience of the prairies. And this piece has um, uh, just been em embraced by by local audiences. Um, there's nothing that I love more than coming down and seeing a group of school kids uh, lying on the floor underneath this piece, which is suspended from the ceiling, looking up at it. It's kinetic, so it, it moves and shines in the sun. And at the same time, I know that they're um, getting a tour by our educators about the meaning of the work, which looks at um, issues around gun violence and um, uh, the oppression of African Americans. Um, but the project that I really wanted to talk about, uh, which really sort of relates to the title of this um, panel, Centering the Margins, is a project we did uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe it was just last year, I'm losing track of time, 2022. Uh, called In the Middle of Everywhere, Artists on the Great Plains. And um, this project was inspired by Gerald McMaster, a curator from uh, Red Pheasant Reserve in Saskatchewan, um, talking about how really the essence of the prairie experience um, was situated in the experience of the wind and the grass. And as soon as I heard him use that phrase, I thought about this, um, this photograph um, of, gosh, now I can't remember the name of the photograph, Boy with June Bug um, by Gordon Parks. And um, we started thinking about the fact that uh, it, would be, it could be interesting for us to think about our place not in terms of national borders, but in terms of the geography of the prairies and the plains as they're known in the states. And um, we put together an exhibition that really looked at um, both contemporary and historical experiences of, uh, of the geography that surrounds us in Saskatoon. So this project was co-curated by um, me and the four, then four curators at Ramey Modern, so a, a five-person show that built really iteratively where one person would bring somebody to the table. You know, I brought Gordon Parks and Agnes Martin, who's um, American uh, 
abstract painter, but she was born in small town Saskatchewan and uh, at times would speak about how her early experiences um, of the prairie landscape went on to in inspire her work. And then my colleagues would think about artists that spoke to the people that were on the table. And together we built a really unusual show that spanned um, the decades that uh, brought together local artists, um, as well as many artists from south of the border. Um, we also included some people who are not typically understood as artists in this slide. Uh, in, the, in the far distance, there are two black and white photographs that were made by um, a Saskatchewan farmer and bush pilot who, um, flying over the, the prairie, had discovered some incredible um, uh, indigenous artifacts that nobody else had seen because you look at the prairie and you don't see much. It just looks like, you know, grass and a rock here and there. But from overhead, he could see that um, these were structures that had been there for hundreds of years that nobody had, had um, come across before. And in making this discovery, he ended up connecting with Dana Claxton, who is a Vancouver-based indigenous artist, but originally from southern Saskatchewan. Um, and the two of them have started working together. So that's Dana's work beside his, where she's making work in the, the spaces that, that he had taken his, um, you know, until then, until being included in this show, uh, photographs that had been deemed hobbyist photographs. So um, there's there's 97 year old Ted having his first first show, um, and this is something it relates to something else that we think about a lot. Like uh, Saskatoon is a place where we have to grow an audience, and a lot of people are. Um, farmers or one generation away from farmers. So how do we think about the creativity that defines their life um, in relationship to art making and exhibition making and the museum experience? So the exhibition um, at Ramey, we have um, a curator of indigenous art, a curator of performance. My interest is in um, art of the African diaspora. And so we built this show that was uh, really um, uh, sort of diverse in its, its interests and, and motivations. Um, in this image, we have work by uh, Edgar Heap of Birds in the far distance. Um, and over to the right of that slide is the piece that Deanna Bowen made about the um, anti uh, Creek Negro petition that um, uh, had um, come together in Alberta in the early 1900s to try and keep out, uh, to keep black immigration from happening to that province. So I think. I think I just have a couple more images of the show. I think the, the summary of what I've been talking about is, um, you know, how, how um, we've come to sort of be working in this museum that uh, people would describe as the middle of nowhere, in a place that people describe as the middle of nowhere, and trying to claim that really the, the breadth of experience and the breadth of things that are relevant to people's experience there really make it the middle of everywhere. Just a couple more images. It was an incredibly diverse show. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just have to maybe just tell you about Take this artist. Um, uh, she was brought to the project by one of my colleagues who um, had found out about an artist who had 
moved to a small town called Salt Coat, Saskatchewan from Japan, I think with her husband. And she started making art there as a way of staying sane, I think. And so when she learned about um, Agnes Martin, she started making work from her family's kimono. Um, kimono that have sort of graphic geometric designs on them. So very much in response to Agnes's work. And that's it. Well, I mean, I think Saskatchewan has had this relationship with the international too, which is interesting because of the Emma Lake workshops. I don't know, could you just speak for a moment about that, that part of the history of the region? Because it's, it's sure um, probably something that you're, like it's also, it's a point of pride regionally, but it's also something to be unpacked and worked against, obviously, yeah. in the work that you're doing, you're doing that. Yeah, so in, in the 1950s, um, uh, some of the professors at the University of Saskatchewan started a summer workshop at um, a kind of lake district site called Emma, Emma Lake. And uh, it really very quickly became a destination for um, painters um, from all over Canada, but also from uh, the States and particularly New York. So I think in 1959, Barnett Newman was there as a workshop leader. A few years later, Clement Greenberg was there. So there's a real um, legacy of abstract painting in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And at one point, Greenberg said that, that Saskatchewan was the second most important center for abstract painting after New York. And, um, but even, even before that, since moving to Saskatoon, I've learned that Saskatchewan had um, the second um, uh, arts board, the second art funding body after the, what is it called in, in England, the National um, Art the British Arts Council. Yeah. So yeah, the Saskatchewan Arts, Arts Board was the, the second funding agency for, for the arts. I mean, I would imagine if we dug down that rabbit hole, <coughs> rabbit hole, we might find that it was a British immigrant person who cloned this idea from UK and planted it in Canada. And then yeah. there goes another you know, iteration, then the Canada Council gets funded, then et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. But your programming is so thoughtful, Michelle, and it's, um, you know, what you're, what you're uh, making of, speaking of the, from that place, um, is so distinctive. <clears throat> and I'm wondering, have you developed a kind of sorority or fraternity of like-minded souls in other uh, Plains institutions that are, you know, you, you talk about transcending the border. Um, do you have like-minded souls that you're now sharing exhibitions with or other projects on the horizon? that make the most of the center that you are? Well, interestingly, when we started this project, it had been our intention to um, sort of really move through the plains and, mm -hmm. and make those connections, but it was still high COVID, so uh -huh. we weren't able to travel yet. But earlier this year, um, my colleague Tara Hope, the curator of Indigenous Art, went on a month-long road trip uh, down like south from Saskatoon, uh, all the way to Texas, <laughs> stopping at Wonderful. different institutions and visiting artists and um, uh, starting the work of, of making those connections. And we, we do think of this Great Plains project as something that will happen every, every few years and have started to talk to the Mackenzie Art Gallery Great. about um, working across our two institutions and hopefully finding another partner in the States. Fantastic. Oh, it's so, it's so interesting. Um, thank you, Michelle. We're going to have questions and a chance to chat afterwards, but... Well, just um, can I ask one quick question before Of course, of course. Um, no, because you had mentioned um, the, dy the, the demographic in, in your city is a little bit different than other parts of Canada. Um, are there any strategies and approaches that you've seen that have worked in terms of uh, getting the community excited, you know, getting them 
energized to participate, see shows, be part of programming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, the Prairies actually has the the largest um, or the fastest growing black population in Canada. Wow. Uh, there's, um, it's very easy to immigrate to Saskatchewan. So it, it is increasingly diverse and um, maybe two, two, ways to answer that question. One, we moved to um, an admission by donation um, model last year, and that has just transformed who's coming into the building. But um, the first exhibition that I did uh, when I got to Saskatoon was a show that I'd been thinking about since I was a grad student. and. Um, Ramey Modern has a collection of Picasso prints. And I'd been thinking about Picasso's relationship to African art and oceanic art um, for like decades. And um, even though our collection is primarily modern and contemporary art, wouldn't you know I found two African masks and um, a number of sculptures from Papua New Guinea. So I was able to do this show and I, I went into it thinking, oh, I hope somebody challenges like questions why we have this and maybe it will lead to like some mindful deaccessioning or something. And instead it led to like multi-generational um, newcomer families Hello. coming into the museum and being incredibly proud to see this this work in in the museum. Good. So Miguel, um, if, if you do you have the clicker? I, I think I <coughs> I have the headset. Yeah, Miguel's going yeah. next. He's goes next, okay. yeah. Oh thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I've oh, got the slides you. are in okay, the good. okay so please advance us and Miguel you're a relative newcomer to Toronto. I met you once in passing a few months ago I guess as you were settling in with a group of Toronto Biennial um, folks, who no doubt we're welcoming you, but you will be co-directing the next Toronto Biennial, so I don't know uh, if you can give us today a bit of background on the, the work that you've done leading up to coming to Toronto and maybe what your plans are, that what we can anticipate your contribution to be and your thinking about making a biennial here in Toronto. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, the Art Toronto for the first time. Uh, as some of you know, I just moved to Toronto five months ago. I just came from Peru, from Lima, where I have been living for a couple of years. Before that, I was in Costa Rica uh, for six years. Is the sound okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, I was in Costa Rica for six years. Um, and and, and Emma, when invited me, when, when Emma invited me for this panel, Emma told me that she was interested in my work in Central America in relation to the title of the panel. So I thought it would be a good idea to, to share a bit of what I've been doing there. Um, <coughs> have a, okay. Yes, great. So I have some notes. Um, to stick to the time and to avoid scrambling. <laughs> okay. Scrambling's okay, you're in a safe place. <laughs> okay, well, between 2015 and 2020, I worked in Theoretica, a nonprofit visual art organization founded in 1999 by Virginia Perez Raton, a prominent Costa Rican artist and curator. The name Theoretica was born from the combination of three words, theory, ethics, and aesthetics, which all together are the basis of its institutional practice. The institution aimed to bring together and make visible artistic production from Central America and the Caribbean. I work in Theoretica in two different capacities. First, a chief curator between 2015 and 2017, and later as co-director since 2018. We actually changed the governance model of the institution and we, uh, five members of the team became co-directors. So that was a really amazing experience. 
since its inception, theoretical reclaim art as a public um, reclaim art as a critical element uh, for public sphere, and fostered a program responsive to the social realities of Central America and the Caribbean, including discursive programs, study sessions, editorial projects, open call for grants, exhibitions, and the creation of a library and archive dedicated to contemporary art from the region. Like other art organizations born in the 1990s, Theoretica aimed to create a regional strategy for the empowerment of local critical thinking and the development of spaces for international conversation. The 1990s was a key decade for Central America as the region was transitioning from more than 20 years of war and armed conflict to the signing of peace agreements in countries such as Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And actually, Costa Rica was the only country in the region that didn't uh, have an armed conflict. So it, was, um, it is still one of the wealthiest countries in the region as well, with a really important public infrastructure, universities, public museums, so in that context, uh, the creation of Theoretica helped it to foster conversations about the role of art in public life and build collaborations that could reverse the stereotypes around Central America, as well as Eurocentric perspective that dominated local art narratives. And these are, this is, are, uh, these are just a uh, few images of the spaces. Uh, Theoretica has two buildings in San Jose, downtown, they are actually houses, not really buildings. I mean, and, and it's really beautiful because um, the projects that Theoretica develops are in conversation with this kind of domestic atmosphere, right? <coughs> Since the passing of the founder, Vir Virginia, in 2010, the institution has been led um, by a new generation of curators, educators, and art professionals who continue the legacy and spirit that drove the creation of the institution. Theoretica is committed to nurturing the context and engaging with local histories as a way to reclaim multiple forms of belonging beyond traditional, traditional nation state identities. During my time in the institution, we developed several projects aimed at generating new research and reclaiming new attention to overlook our practices that we felt were extremely relevant and could, and could inform the struggles of the present day. This is um, a US-born Costa Rican photographer, Victoria Cabezas, who developed a pioneer work that intersected experimental uses of photography, conceptual art, theatricality, and gender issues in the 1970s and 80s, or since the 1970s and 80s. Uh, Theoretica presented an historical overview of her photographic projects in dialogue with feminist artist Priscilla Monge in 2018, which traveled to the galleries of the American Society in New York uh, in 2019. These two works are from 1973. This is part of a series of uh, photographic experiments around banana iconography and the exoticization of Central American nations addressing sexual identity and stereotypes in relation to tropical landscapes. Well, as you can see, uh, Cabezas uh, uses photography uh, in a performative way. Uh, uh, she's, in, in, she's trying to counter this racist connotation of the notion of the banana republic, which was very much present in the conversation during the 70s, uh, with the aim to generate public discussion about that. Her images responded with irony to advertising campaigns and the promise of the perfectly shaped, always accessible banana, as well as to masculine tropes of colonial power and Western extract, extract, extractive practices. Well, these uh, photographic experimentations were not well received in Costa Rica in the 1970s. Uh, you know, experimental uses of photography were not at all common. And that meant that most of these images remain absent from public discussion for uh, almost five decades. And for, from today's perspective, it is very clear that Victoria Cabeza's feminist, feminist critique reveals a deep awareness of the intersection of 
colonialism and patriarchy, among other issues. So these are two images of, of the show that we presented. And this is um, an installation view of, uh, of the retrospective of Nicaraguan sculpture, Patricia Belli, which was the beginning of a series of exhibitions uh, devoted to pioneer women artists in Central America. Well, Victoria Cabezas was also part of that series. Um, this was 2016. Uh, we presented a revision of three decades of her work, which was also an opportunity to organize her archive that included extensive documentation of Nicaragua art from the 80s and 90s that is now available at Theoretica's library. Uh, Patricia Belli was one of the driving forces in the introduction of experiment experimental art languages in the 1980s that accompanied the rise of feminist debates that challenged the masculine structures of the Sandinista revolution. Her work embrace, embraces a shared condition of vulnerability. And this retrospective exhibition that we presented in Theoretica in 2016 was also important because it was the first international traveling exhibition within Central America. After Costa Rica, it went to Nicaragua and Guatemala in 2017. So if in the, if, if in the 1990s, Theoretica was interested in, or Virginia and Theoretica was interested in putting Central American artists um, in, the, in the events of the city centers of, of, of Europe, let's say, Paris, Venice, or Madrid, you know, for us in 2016, rather than reinforcing the given structures of power and visibility, it was more important to open up new networks of roads for our circulation, and that meant to create conversations between uh, the few art institutions that exist in Central America. So um, fostering institutional collaboration was crucial in a context where infrastructure is still scarce and fragile. Uh, Central America is also characterized with the non-existing public support for contemporary art, you know, only Costa Rica. Only two countries in, in the region has contemporary art museums. Uh, so the exhibition, this retrospective exhibition, was born with the desire of not only honoring the long trajectory of the amazing artist and educator, Patricia Belli, but also promoting in interinstitutional al alliances for the study of shared regional histories, the implementation of educational programs, and the promotion of an active exchange of our practitioners. We were consolidating those collaborations that unfortunately were interrupted during the pandemic. <clears throat> One challenge I faced upon my arrival in Costa Rica in 2015 was defining a program in a context I didn't know in depth. I thought then that I needed to get close to the people who advanced critical reflection on the cultural landscape of the Central American region. So one early decision was to reactivate Theoretica, Theoretica's printed publications program to learn from what had come before. That program was, I mean, the editorial program was very active since 1999 until the passing of the founder director, Virginia, in 2010. Making books is for me a way of studying one context. I like to think of them as lightning roads that attract and capture the, ele the ele electrostatic discharge of a thought process. The bilingual series, Escrituras Locales, Posiciones Críticas de América Central, El Caribe y Sus Diásporas, Local Writings, Critical Positions from Central America, the Caribbean, and its Diasporas, published between 2016 and 2021, was a collection of writings by curators, critics, and artists who play a key role in changing the conditions for thinking and creating art, such as Tamara Diaz Bringas from Cuba, Costa Rica, Adrián Samos from Panama, Rosina Casali from Guatemala, Raúl Quintanilla from Nicaragua, Anna Lee Davis from Barbados, and Virginia Perez Ratón from Costa Rica. A starting point for this series was to consider how local knowledge could offer other origins for debates around the contemporary. The selected authors not only explore the relationship between art production and social transformation, but they also invited 
to embrace, invited us to embrace unpre unpre unpredictability within art institutions and to visualize a world beyond official sanctioned white narratives of the global north. This sentiment was expressed beautifully in the title of the fifth book in the series, Annalie Davis, on being committed to a small place from 2019, which reflects on the critical possibilities of art in the post-colonial and post-independence Caribbean. When thinking of the title of this panel, Centered in the Margins, the first things that came to my mind is that to change power structures and traditional art narratives, we need to invest in creating infrastructure, which is for me one of the key, aspe one of the key aspects of curatorial practice. Infrastructure building means transforming the physical and affective structures to increase accessibility and equity and promoting a diversity of relationships and alliances from creating independent art spaces and experimental platforms and expanding collective practices to starting editorial projects, doing tons of books and helping to create archives devoted to documenting and making accessible crucial crucial chapters of our collective histories. This is what I have been doing for more than 15 years, mainly in Latin America. Building infrastructure always involves empowering the local art ecology. And this is my last slide. <laughs> well, as, as I said, I moved here um, five months ago uh, to join this amazing team of the Toronto Biennial. Um, I'm, really, I'm really happy to be here. Um, as you know, the Toronto Biennial is a 10-week event that commissions artists to create amazing work in dialogue with the city of Toronto. Uh, we are 11 months away uh, from the opening, which is September 21st, 2024, so please save the date. <laughs> this is the third edition. Save the I, month. Yes. And I feel very honored to be part of a project that was conceived as a driving force for nurturing the local cultural ecosystem and an opportunity to leave a mark on the city's social fabric. I started to work um, on this project in December. I just moved here in May. Um, I am working with Dominique Fontaine, my brilliant co-curator from Montreal. Uh, and together we are developing a collaborative uh, model that included dialogue and listening as the key uh, aspects of it. So we were traveling, as you probably know as well, uh, I think the, the TVA uh, Instagram account has been very actively in sharing images and, and, and also what we were seeing and all the people that we met, which has been a really transformative experience. So we are really happy to show with you what we are preparing. Uh, the first press release is going to be out in two weeks. So I'm not going to share Beautiful. any names for now. Also because, you know, my co-curator, Dominique, is not here in Toronto. And I know that for her it's really important to be present when we announce it properly. But we are sharing the first press release in two weeks. And then we are having a, the second curatorial encounters on November 15, and Dominique and I were talking, we'll be talking about the whole uh, curatorial process and, and sharing the first, um, a conversation with the first um, artist that will be announced in a few Great. days, yes. Well, we'll all be waiting for that. And yeah. I think, um, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting paradox in Toronto because it's central in Canada, it's the biggest city in Canada, but it's peripheral in terms of global art markets and so on, so to the, big, the bigger centers internationally. <clears throat> so it's both a, a center and not a center. So I'm really curious to see what you will be making of that. I wanted to ask you to just spend a few minutes talking about a radical recentering or centering that you did uh, of Cecilia Vicuna, an artist that you've been working with. And I think you're, I have to say that Miguel is the, gets the gold prize for uh, exhibition titles because um, Cecilia Vicuna, See Hearing the Enlightened Failure was your first show, and you're making a new show called Dreaming Water. But I have to also note my favorite exhibition title to date, mm -hmm. Hard to Swallow, Anti-Patriarchal Poetics and the New Scene in the 90s, which I think is, just, is so brilliant. But can you tell me about the, your strategies for centering Cecilia's work, which had, of course, been kind of in oblivion for decades, and, and now she is the central figure, like in a matter of 
three or four years has become the central figure in the repositioning of that art of that period. Can you share just a few minutes on that before we go ahead? Because I imagine our time is slipping through our fingers, but it's too tempting. No, absolutely. Um, I think it's a collective work, really. Uh, I've been working with Cecilia for 10 years now, and that was really beautiful. And I have to say that it's, it is kind of magic for me as well. I actually remember the first time I visited in her in her apartment in New York. You know, she actually opened the door, and she had like a quartz pendulum. So she basically, you know, swung the, the pendulum in front of me, and she asked the stone if I would be good for her <laughs> with her eyes closed, right? No intimidation there. And, and it was really like, I wasn't expecting that. Um, and I assumed that she received an answer after a few seconds because she smiled and let me in. And that was the beginning, you know? And that was really beautiful because um, Cecilia trust, trusted me and she opened her archive in a way that she never did before. So we started to work together. I remember that that day in her apartment, I proposed to her to do the retrospective exhibition that was 2014, and she laughed at me. I mean, she said, Miguel, are you insane? Who will be interested in showing my work like that, right? And the curious thing is that she wasn't, um, I mean, she was right. At the very beginning, it was very difficult to find a place for the retrospective exhibition. And actually, we, we, I, I mean, we were in contact with some museums in Latin America in some, a couple of places in New York, where very few people or very few institutions thought that Cecilia had enough work to fill the rooms or that the work was relevant enough. I mean, that was before Documenta right, um, where she presented a series of paintings and this really huge sculpture of the quipus that really changed the perception, in a way, globally. But at that time, yeah, she was right, you know? It was, we were struggling a lot, and, and in 2017, um, um, I mean, I was all the time talking about Cecilia, all the, I mean, I was invited to a talk, to a symposium, to whatever, so I was all the time talking about Cecilia, and, Sofia Hernandez Choncuy, she was just um, appointed as director of Bit the Bit, that just changed this name to Kunst Institut Meli in Rotterdam. And she truly believed that it was a great idea to show uh, Cecilia's work. And she was super interested actually in her, in, in, in her as a, in, in Cecilia as a poet, right? Moving from poetry to visual arts. Um, and, and that was the beginning, I would say, you know, freely understanding the complexity of Cecilia. That exhibition, is, yeah, the, the, the opening was in May 2019. We published the first monographic book on Cecilia Vicuña. She was 72, right, at that time. Um, and that book has three editions now. You know, the exhibition traveled to Mexico City. The pandemic happened. Then it traveled during the pandemic to Madrid and to Colombia. And still, I mean, it had, had a huge impact. Uh, and then, yes, I just curated another retrospective that just opened in Chile, that is traveling to Buenos Aires. The opening is in a month, more or less. And we are publishing another monographic book, a truly amazing, uh, comprehensive book, including a lot of unpublished material from the 60s and 70s. Um, and yeah, this, this book is going to, you know, circulate widely because that the first book that will be published in Rotterdam was sold out in six months. So there is no copy available. If you Education. actually look at it in Amazon, you are lucky if you find one copy for $200, but it's really difficult to find it. But I'm I mean, and I, it's really beautiful because for me, it is how to create the conditions, you know, for the artist's work to be understood, you know, and to reclaim the polit the, the, her political agency, the political agency of the work, you know, the urgency, because it's not, a, it's not a thing of the past. It's actually intervening in the present time. I mean, I think what's so interesting about it is that, you know, an accomplishment like that, and again, congratulations, uh, because I can imagine what you were up against trying to get the momentum going. But it, it not only does a great thing for Vicuña's, you know, uh, legacy going forward, um, but it also, a discovery like that, that's sort of hiding in plain light, also, I think, galvanized. It's kind of a catalytic effect to the art community in general. Like, what else have we missed? You know, so, like, to be able to bring something so spectacular forward to the public that, you know, was actually right there um, to find, it, it prompts a whole other... Uh, excavation of the past for other lost legacies. So congratulations for that. And again, we can't wait to see what you 
Can they ask one quick question? Yeah. Um, this is practical curatorial question. Um, what kept you motivated as people kept saying no? Mm. They said, no, this is important. Because I've been on that journey where I've got the proposal, yeah. pitch it to 20 institutions, and it's either timing isn't right, yeah. it's not their thing, whatever excuse. But what kept you steadfast that, like, Oh, this is this is going to happen. Yeah, no, yeah. I think for curators, it's about truly, truly believing in the importance of something, right? Uh, I mean, uh, for me, it was uh, I was I was transformed by Cecilia's work, and I really wanted to share that, you know, that experience of transformation, that opportunity to be transformed by her practice, and also I was pretty much aware that we really need to change the set of cultural values the dominant cultural values. And the only uh, way to do that is to push and push and push until it happens. So it, it is an opportunity to reframe and to rethink what is important, right? What are the cultural values that we use to organize our history in general, right? And, and, and yes, I, I think for me also was a, a, the commitment that I have, you know, uh, because I truly believe that Art has a role in, in public life, you know, and I, I feel that uh, Cecilia's practice has so much to say, and I feel that I, yeah, I just, I just need to stick with that commitment and to make that happen until it happens, because it will happen at some point. Yeah, yeah. So yes. Thank you so much. So Larry Osei Mensa, co-founder uh, of Art Noir, uh, everywhere, uh, savoir faire is everywhere, from what I can see. Uh, looking at your website and seeing all the projects you, that you do. I, um, I also, you know, notice the extraordinary resourcing of your projects. When I look at your website and see all of your partners, I see that there's the, uh, an amazing ability to attract resources to your project that is normally considered the domain of the big museum, you know, the big boxes that uh, more conventional fundraising mechanics around those um, enterprises. But maybe tell me how you how you launched Art Noir, and you have your slides to show today that you want to, things you want to focus on. But we're just so lucky to have you here in Toronto, so I'm going to get out of the way and ask you to tell us what what, what you do. Thank you, um, thank you. I mean that's amazing. Thank you guys for being here. I just want to get a quick read of the room so I know who I'm talking to. So how many artists are in the room? Raise your hands high. Don't be shy. Uh, curators. Collectors, cultural workers. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, nice. So my name is Larry Simmons. Uh, I am a curator, co-founder of Art Noir, um, first generation Ghanaian American, born and raised in the Bronx, still live in the Bronx. Uh, I'm still trying to find new language around it, but self-taught as a curator. So my background, and I think it of tales to your point, actually comes my degrees in business management. Right. I have an MBA in marketing and hospitality management. Um, so I often think about the entrepreneurial components of being part of this ecosystem, right? You said the Bronx teaches you how to hustle. Yeah, <laughs> it does. I mean, yeah. this is the environment I grew up in, in the 80s, yeah. right? You know, 70s, 80s. You have landlords burning buildings to get the insurance money, uh, disenfranchised, lack of resources. I don't know if it's still accurate, but I remember reading a stat a couple years ago that the Bronx is one of the poorest counties in the United States, right? But growing up there, this is not, you know, a fact of life that's like salient to me, you know? I think for me, it was just more about, you know, this, you know, exposure to hip hop, which is 50 years uh, all this year, and you know, so the ingenuity and the innovation, being in a community that's primarily Caribbean, Latin, Latinx, African, and uh, how do we pull from that kind of cultural background to create space that feels like home, um, create space where we can engage and learn from each other. Um, and so for me, those are kind of like the foundational pieces that, you know, when I do run into challenges trying to collaborate with an institution, you know, I think about where I came from and I think about uh, the audiences that I want to engage through the practice. 
Um, I don't take no for an answer, so you figure it out. Um, in terms of pivoting into the art world, um, did my grad school in Switzerland while I was living there, traveling around Europe, you know, kind of inspired by, you know, Baldwin and Quincy Jones and Marvin Gaye, all these individuals who went to Europe and kind of found themselves and found a sense of freedom and liberation and uh, a capacity to express themselves. I picked up a camera and I started doing photography. Um, and that was kind of like a way to document my experience for people that were in my community. And moved back, started doing exhibitions. Um, first exhibition was actually in the back of a boutique in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So my first exhibition is like not in the White Cube, it's in a store on Flatbush Avenue um, in the community. You know, so these are the building blocks in terms of how it shapes how I think about the practice now. And I realized that, you know, and I never called myself an artist. You know, I think for me, I was just making and creating and sharing. But even in that exercise, it was very difficult. I didn't like the critique. <laughs> I didn't like the feedback. Photographers can be mean to each other. They can indeed. And so I said, OK, what else can I do? So then I started writing about art. And then in about you know, 2009, I kind of realized that there weren't enough platforms to black and brown artists. Because at that time, you know, a commercial gallery may have one artist of color in the program. You know, so thank God for an organization like Rush Arts, started by Danny Simmons. Eric Adams was working there at the time. And they gave me a platform to kind of showcase artists of my generation. And that's primarily who I exhibit. You know, but I'm also, you know, I've had my moment with like Sonia Gomez, for example, mm. who I'm working on a project with uh, for, Storm, for Storm King, which will be her first outdoor exhibition. She's 74 years old. And so for me, it's exciting because we're going to figure this out together, right? Um, and so for me, you know, writing about art, curating, joining museum groups, and then seeing kind of the increased interest, support, opportunities, you know, I had to kind of develop, you know, a strategy around, okay, when people invite me to do things, like how am I determining whether this is the right opportunity? You know, so I'm always thinking about access. You know, so like, I, I'll, I'll have a picture later, but I, I um, did the first solo exhibition of Omako Boafo in North America. Um, we took it to Moad in San Francisco, Cam in Houston, Seattle Art Museum in Denver. And these are all great cultural cities, but like if you live in the States, they're not necessarily the first places you're thinking about seeing an exhibition, particularly of an artist who, you know, is, is on everybody's radar. And that show came to be because I was kind of frustrated at the fact that everything, all the conversations, all the articles I was reading just talked about the price of the work. We didn't talk about the content of the work. And I was becoming concerned that, you know, the star would ascend and flame out. So I said, we got to do this museum show because, you know, museums, you know, within this ecosystem is a form of validation, right? And then also a lot of people hadn't had an opportunity to see a multitude of work in one place. You may see it online, Instagram, auctions, or group show. And we were able to call together, you know, about 30 plus works from 2016 to 2022. And it was great because every venue was different. And, you know, now it's at the Denver Art Museum, which is the last. We created this really incredible reading room. And it's been interesting to talk to the team at the museum because we partnered with the Denver Public Library. So you literally can go into the reading room. If you find a book you like, scan the QR code. You can order the book when it's available. They'll email you, and then you know you can continue the conversation that was sparking through the exhibition. And so, you know, my big my business background has always uh, programmed me to figure out where there ways to cross pollinate. You know, so I'm a library nerd. You know, that was my sanctuary growing up in New York City. Um, this access to information, which is free. You know, um, so thinking about access. Thinking about how you create a sense of belonging, because when I started my journey in the art world, the room did not look like this. You know, and I was often the only person of color in the room. 
Um, and I wouldn't say there was a malicious attempt to not make me feel welcome, but it was like, you didn't feel like you were part of the conversation. Mm. You know, and I have a good friend of mine, Amani Olu, who's from Philadelphia. We kind of started together. We, we got, you know, we, we put our heads together and it's like, he grew up in Philly, I grew up in New York, and it was like, okay, the art world's not gonna invite us to the table. So how do we create our own table, right? And I think that's kind of part of the impetus of creating Art Noir. Um, you know, so for me, curiosity is always kind of what stimulates the shows. You know, there's colleagues in the room that I've had conversations with and they may say something and I'd be like, oh, that's a good exhibition idea, right? Or, you know, thinking about diversity more expansively, right? Because I feel like, you know, corporate America's kind of co-opted the term and in some cases flattened it um, and really or appropriated not. appropriated it as their own marketing oh, One more vehicle. time? Or appropriated it yeah. as their own marketing vehicle. And so for me, it's like, okay, coming from the Bronx, it's like, all right, how do you, how do you pivot? You know, how do you adapt um, to ensure that the, the interest, the ideas, the concerns of the communities who, you know, for me, I think of the majority. So I even try not to use, like, language like marginalized because, like, it's our communities that make culture dynamic, right? But I think we've been kind of brainwashed into thinking it's the inverse. Um, and so thinking about diversity, you know, from a cultural standpoint, ethnic, psychographic, socioeconomic, you know, all the kind of isms that kind of uh, shape one's identity. And how do you try to create space to kind of engage this multiplicity of existence? And then, you know, collaboration. And so, so this is um, install views uh, from some shows. So uh, I did work in a museum. So I was, I am the former senior curator of the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. And it was not a fit for me, yeah. um, because I I, uh, I wouldn't say I'm rebellious in nature, but I think there are things about the institutional structure that don't make sense to me. Um, and I try to be practical about a lot of things. And so I found that I'm a better partner with the institution as opposed to being in the institution, right? Because I understand the function, I understand where there'll be challenges for the most part, and then, you know, sometimes you have people who have great ideas, but because of the structure, they don't necessarily have a voice. Or they're scared that if they say something, they may get reprimanded. So I'm the guy that will come in and speak on your behalf because you can't fire me. Yeah, exactly. I'm not an employee. <laughs> I'm not an employee. Right? Yeah. But I think also, like, it, it stimulates really beautiful conversations that, you know, Cracks sometimes... open yeah. a, a new space for people to work together. With exactly. Them. And so... Sometimes it's like, you know, hiding in plain sight. Yeah. But you need someone who's not necessarily in it every day to kind of point it out in a way that's loving yeah. and hopefully uh, constructive. Yeah. And so my, my practice is pretty much nomadic now, right? So I learn by immersing myself in these different communities and understanding the challenges, but then also kind of the beauty of these spaces. And so, you know, on the left is an exhibition that just closed in Brazil called The Speed of Grace. Um, it was a group exhibition, and uh, it was artists from across the diaspora. And for me, I'm also trying to wrestle with that, what that means. I think we typically kind of assign that to like African diaspora, but for me, it's, it's any community that's kind of been affected by colonialism. Like I was in El Salvador in February, I was like, oh, I'm home. <laughs> no, literally, like, the driver who picks me up from the airport speaks no English, but we turn on Bad Bunny, and <laughs> yeah. we're connected, <laughs> connected, right? And so for me, it's like, how do you find these points of connection, even though maybe language might be, you know, in some cases, for me, a superficial barrier. Um, and so this show was great in terms of we had artists from the Caribbean, North America, Africa, Europe, and Brazil all coming into conversation. And it's open before the biennial, Sao Paulo Biennial. It was the first time in the biennial's history that they had black curators. And so for me, I'm using that as like a point of reference. Emmanuel Adahuja, who I had the opportunity to spend time with last year, he's a point of reference and what he built with the Afro-Brazilian Museum. And then what does it look like to bring the diaspora to Brazil? Because usually it's the inverse, right? Um, and then the other show in your top right 
is Sounds of Blackness. It's a group show I curated in Manila in March at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila. It's the first group show of black artists in Southeast Asia. And, you know, for me, I mean, it was a multitude of reasons. I collaborated with Tim Tan, who's a friend and, and, and collector. And it was four or five collectors from Southeast Asia that we kind of source work from. Because I wanted to create an experience where people could see this work firsthand. Because particularly in Asia, a lot of these works are seen you know, through the lens of the auction house or online. And seeing what conversations it stimulates, you know, not only about identity, but about process, um, art production, um, art history, and then really being in conversation with Filipino artists and them finding points of entry and inspiration for their practices. And then uh, on the bottom right, that's an install view from the Denver Art Museum of Marco Boafo, Solo Black Folks, um, inspired by W.E.B. Du Bois's book written in 1903, which was an assessment of black life at the turn of the 20th century. And for me, as I was you know, getting to know him and understanding the practice, for me, it felt like an assessment of black life in the you know, 21st century, particularly being an artist you know, who primarily works on the continent and what he's been able to do to kind of reframe just the thinking about being an artist who can live and work in Africa, show internationally, and not necessarily have to move to Europe or move to the, you know, North America. Before, it's like you came here, you went to school, you stayed, you sent money back, you go on holiday, you establish a program, but now these artists are there establishing the programs and they're invested there. Staying in their own community. Yeah, yeah and that's incredibly valuable because now you know as many of you who are first generation you know being an artist was not a conversation or curator you were having with your parents yeah. you know, 10 20 years ago yeah. but now it's a viable vocation like my mom is you know through our, our uh, contemporary uh, communication tool sending me images on whatsapp mm -hmm. saying oh this is a young artist they can draw you should check them out, check and, it out. Yeah. And, it's, and it's cool you know and, and sometimes they're interesting and sometimes it's just a mom being a mom and loving. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, yeah. But how that's changing a generation is really fascinating. And so I'm always just trying to strive and tap into these different communities. And then think about, all right, how do I take someone from Brazil and then you know, explore an opportunity to show their work in Toronto? Because exactly. there's a significant Portuguese community here. Exactly. Right? And how do you create? a situation where they see themselves reflected in a way that centers them, their culture, their identity, their language, um, that may not have happened before. And then, uh, where is it? Last slide, so Art Noir. So Art Noir um, is a nonprofit I co-founded. Uh, one of my co-founders is here, Jane Ayello. Seven of us in the formal organization, but it was a crew of us, and they started off you know, with art trips, but it also was out of frustration. I was part of a couple of museum groups, you know, so this is 2013, where it was always a challenge to get them to wanna do studio visits with artists of color, consider artists of color for acquisition. And, you know, being from the Bronx, instead of complaining, it was like, all right, how do we create our own institution, right? And it's been interesting to see how it's evolved in terms of being advocates, for artists, you know, black and brown, Asian American, indigenous, across mediums. And COVID, I think we really kind of had an inflection point because a lot of colleagues were being laid off and furloughed. And, you know, in collaboration with the artists, we were able to raise $150,000 that we then used to create a micro-grant program. Right. And so what's interesting, so we're a 501c3, none of us take a salary. So any money that comes in is redistributed right into wow. the community. And so even this year, we started a scholarship program. Where we awarded uh, eight full-time scholarships to artists who were in the CUNY system. Mm -hmm. you know, so not Columbia, not Yale, but city colleges in the boroughs of New York City. And then more recently, um, now we're becoming, I guess, a philanthropic engine because we supported Ashley James' exhibition, Going Dark, which is currently on view at the Guggenheim. And for me, it's historic because she's the first black staff curator to curate in that rotunda. Wow. You know, she's a friend and colleague, and I was like, 
I want to see our names on that yeah. list. Yeah. yeah. You know? And then as of last week, John Comfort, who's a friend and mentor, we're supporting the UK Pavilion. Fantastic. Right? So I think it's a cool space to be in because, like, we know we have to be malleable. Obviously, there needs to be structure. But we're able to be engaged on a multitude of levels, whether it's cultivating patrons, whether it's collaborating with other curators, whether it's collaborating with artists, but now redistributing this capital into communities uh, who need it. Right? And so it's been a really exciting exercise and you know, continuing to grow and evolve and see how we continue to be of service. So there's a word that I think we've, we've managed to flow past the one hour mark, so I'm just gonna ask you all to bear with me while I, while I ask you one last question, Larry, which is there's a word that comes up in your materials that I've been looking at over the last few weeks, and that's the word love. Yeah. Um, fantastic uh, fundraising initiative you have called the Jar of Love Fund. And I see on your website uh, the James Baldwin quote, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Can you talk about why that quote is so important to you and, and the, basically the power of love and how that operates in the art world? It's not a word we think about all that much, but it's a really good one. Yeah, I think, you know, I actually had lunch with Micheline Thomas a couple weeks ago, like good friend and mentor. And we talked about how operating in this space can be so transactional, yeah. right? When really, um, it needs to be organic. It needs to be intentional, right? Because the one thing that's interesting about our community is that it's human-centric. I think we sometimes forget that. Yeah. Um, and I think the artists are our troubadours. They help us understand. They help illuminate. They help us question. And, you know, when we're talking about centering, for us, it's for me, for Art Noir, for a lot of my colleagues, it's about centering the artists and making sure that they know that what they do enlivens our lives, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it doesn't, you know, and I talk to artists and, like, they may apply for a grant and don't get it. And it's, like, really interesting to see how discouraged they get. You know, and I think with the micro-grant, you know, we give grants from between five hundred and three thousand dollars, right? And it's like, also sometimes it's just a, a, a an effort to acknowledge that we see you, right? Like Vanessa German, who's a friend and colleague, had an unfortunate incident at an art space she has in Pittsburgh, which I happened to have visited, and she had a fire. You know, and and what's great is that you know because it's just us, we don't have like a board of directors. It's like, hey. Vanessa had a fire, I've been to this place, it's an important node in the community in Pittsburgh, I want to support, what do you think, as long as four of us say yes, and it's a yes, Your way. Yeah. you know, and so I think trying to strip down and strip away the bureaucracy and really get to the core of like, how can we support artists, be in collaboration with them, celebrate them, um, because I know for me, art saved my life. Well, and really to put the power closest to the people who are closest to those communities. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Because I think for me, if it weren't things for like, even though I was a terrible break dancer, break dancing. <laughs> we want to see that. Know, <laughs> but all of these kind of expressions that just kind of emerged from the environment that I grew up in, just as a result of, you know, responding to the condition, escaping the condition. You know, these are things that fortify me. And it's and reshaping the condition. Exactly. And seeing how that's changed, you know, multiple generations, even now in 2023. So. Incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, for being so open hearted and sharing your work with us today. I think we all feel incredibly privileged to be here. And enjoy your time in Toronto. I don't know that if this is your first visit to Toronto. Uh, second. First time I came was for Carabana. We'll, get, good one. we'll keep on coming back and keep on messing with our institutions and keep, it, keep us moving, keep us connected. Thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.